Do you ever get tired of managing state? I know I do. That's why I have been working on State Adapt. It's my state management library. It's one of the two reasons. One reason is for reactivity. The other reason is because I'm sick of managing state like this. See, spreading state object, um, toggling a Boolean. Even if it's not, like even if you're using something like Immer and you're just uh, not exactly spreading state, but just doing imperative changes to like a state draft, um, it can get really repetitive doing these, you know, these same operations over and over and over again. So I think the solution is state adapters. So what are state adapters exactly? State adapters are objects that contain functions for manipulating state. So uh, it was introduced by NGX Entity originally and then copied over to Redux uh, Toolkit. It's funny, if you look at the source code, it's like literally the exact same. But um, it's... It's basically uh, an object of pure functions, and on the top level, you've got like state change functions, you know, like uh, add one, add many, things like that. And so they're pure functions, and they take in state and a payload, and they return a new state. Um, and then they also have selectors, and those are also pure functions, and they select from that interface. So basically, focused on a single type or interface, it's just all the state change logic that might pertain to that specific interface or type. So it's like a really portable thing, it's reusable, it's really awesome. So we have Entity Adapter with NGRX and Redux and, and all the, a ton of other spin-off state management libraries. Uh, why don't we have a Boolean adapter? A boole Booleans are really, really simple. They're the simplest type of state. Um, but it, they would enable us, instead of having to do this every time, we could just call a single function. Um, how, how nice would that be? I think that'd be pretty nice. And so even for the simplest type of state, state adapters can actually be nice. And the portability aspect of it is actually really important. So normally when we write Redux or RangerX code, it looks something like this, where we have uh, a specific action with specific sources dispatching it, and then we have a, a reducer that's managing specific state. And then we have the logic right here embedded inside this, uh, this context. So what if you want to reuse this logic somewhere else though? That's actually a problem because it's, it's tied to a specific action. Um, so normally what we would do is it takes some work to decouple this, but we could extract this into a pure function. And then we have to like type the inputs and uh, kind of make it a standalone function and that, that takes a little bit of work. So normally people aren't going to do that, but that's actually what NGRX Entity and Redux Toolkit have done with the Entity Adapter. Um, but for most things, it's not like that. So, but imagine if in object-oriented programming, this was how we managed state. Uh, I mean, I'm not a big object. I actually don't like object-oriented programming, but um, it. imagine though that in object-oriented programming, you couldn't instantiate a class. Every class you created was the instance itself. And so you can't do the new keyword. And so the, the logic that's in the class is tied to the specific state that it's managing. So what would people do if they want to reuse that logic? Well, you'd have to extract it out into these like utility functions. And then inside the class, you would just call those utility functions. And basically what would be left inside your class is just a shell like a, just like a, a slab of boilerplate code that just references the real logic that's outside of it. It actually sucked pretty bad. But actually, that might sound familiar to you because that's kind of how reducers are when they use NGRX Entity. Um, because the reusable logic is in the entity adapter. And then your reducer is just sort of like a, a weird middleman that's calling it, but there's also a lot of boilerplate that's still required. So let's, let's look at an example of that. So here we're using the NGRX entity adapter and we're adding one, but we also want to change something else in state. So we pass the new state into the entity adapter. So it ends up spreading it twice, but that's not a big deal <clears throat> anyway. Um, but yeah, so this, this whole thing is kind of like this pass through boilerplate that is kind of annoying. So ideally, we'd be able to have an 
an adapter, a state adapter that we could reference directly instead of having this, this, you know, pass through boilerplate. Um, and so what we would do is we'd have all our state logic defined in an adapter. So if we had like an async entity adapter, maybe it could have a function on it, add one resolve, or that's probably not a good name, but just something that handles both state changes, adding one and setting loading to false. You know, why not? It's reusable. How many times have we managed this state? Are we, are we sick of it yet? I got sick of it like four years ago. So anyway, yeah, that's better, but there's still a bit of boilerplate. So if we just, we just always wrote our state management logic inside adapters where it could be reused, then it would be decoupled from any specific adapter. And then in the adapter itself, we could just connect the, uh, the, the success action, whatever is triggering the state change to this in order to do this, the adapter pattern that NGX entity uh, established, it would need to swap, swap the <laughs> switch and swap the state and payload uh, parameters. So that they're in the same order that they would be passed in to the reducer. So, and, and this connect thing, if, if you're familiar with Rx, Rx Angular, this is very similar to like a connect type thing. So yeah, all these patterns are similar to each other, but anyway, so now the reducer contains pretty much no boilerplate. So that's great. And our adapter code is defined outside or independent, but to reduce boilerplate even more, it'd be nice if we could define it in line with the reducer. Um, but with, with NGX and, and Redux, we don't have the ability to do that. So we, uh, this is kind of the best we can do. Um, we really need like a state management library that's built on top of the adapter pattern. And that's what state adapt is. So that is why I've spent a ton of time making state adapt because I actually think that it has value. So, um, but you don't have to like dive into it completely. What I want to focus on is just the state adapters themselves, because you can use this with Redux and NGRX and you don't have to use the state adapt whole library. You can just use the adapter utility methods because these things are actually really, really powerful on their own. So that's why I split up the libraries. I have a core library that just does adapter and selector stuff. And then I have an ArcGIS library um, after that, and then an Angular, React. I'm gonna create one for Svelte, gonna create one for Solid. And Quick is kind of weird. I don't know what I'm gonna do with Quick, but anyway, so yeah. So let's let's talk about the uh, first the patterns that are possible state adapters, and then along the way I'll explain the utilities that I created as I use them. So let's take a first look here at composability. So your state shape is basically usually going to be composed of other types or interfaces. So if you have like an option state. Um, uh, you might have a value property that's a string and a check property that's a Boolean. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned a Boolean adapter that's possible. So that, that you know comes in use here. And then what if we also had a string adapter? So we've got two very, very single uh, purpose adapters that are really good at managing extremely simple state. But just as our option state is composed of these to simpler states. What if we could create an adapter that's composed of these more simple adapters? So that's actually where the first utility comes in. Um, well, first I'm going to show you how to how with state adapt you'd create a simple adapter. So the point of this utility is to provide type inference. So that this is why this word syntax exists because it's a TypeScript thing. Um, you ha you I. So the type inference comes from uh, generics, uh, but yeah, so this gets automatically set to a Boolean with, with TypeScript. And yeah, so anyway, it, yeah, this is how it has to be. But anyway, it, it lets you define these state change functions that you can, that you can do to a Boolean and 
Uh, yeah, those are, so they're very basic. So you can basically set it to true, set it to false, or toggle it. Very, very simple. And then you can imagine a similar thing for, for string adapter. Um, I actually made two different ones for string adapter. One I just barely made yesterday. It's called base string adapter. Um, and all it is is create adapter, and it's empty. It just has a type string. Because this also creates some standard uh, functions like set, reset, and uh, oh, uh, no op. It just does nothing. It's for it's irrelevant to this topic. Anyway, so yeah, imagine. So imagine you have this boolean adapter you define like this, and then maybe a similar one for a string adapter. And so one way you could create the option adapter that is that composes these other adapters is like this. Basically, just reference it directly. So you might have um, a, a state change called toggle checked. It's not just toggle because now checked is a property. Um, and so it's a property, so it's nested. So we do the state spreading. We're all familiar with this. But then you, you let the Boolean adapter handle this state change. Um, it has nothing to do with the parent adapter. We're just deferring to this inner adapter. And we probably, I probably should have had that happen here too. Anyway, but this actually sucks because that long thing could have just been this short thing with the exclamation point at the beginning. So that actually sucks. Um, and so I created this utility called join adapters that basically takes in the interface of like the parent state and then it takes in the namespace you want to give each adapter and then you give the adapter itself. So this does a lot of uh, TypeScript magic. With this, it creates all of this. It's crazy, right? So I'll explain this. First, it creates the basic uh, state change functions. Uh, I didn't put no op on here because it's irrelevant. Um, but you can set the main state. You can update it by uh, sp it'll spread uh, an option or um, an object. And the reason it, it has update here is because the create adapter function and join adapters, it it knows if if your state is shaped like an object, and if it is, then it tells you you've got this function available. And then reset um, initial state is a third parameter passed into these state change functions, and then it just returns to that. And then uh, I've got set value, uh, which comes from the string adapter. So up here we did value comes from base string adapter. Base string adapter, like all adapters, it has a set state change function. So what we did here is we put value at the end of that function name. So we did some string manipulation with TypeScript and it generated this function for us. So basically, and it does this efficiently. I don't know how you do this inefficiently, but um, so we've got set value, and this will set the value property to the thing that you pass in. So it's just so cool that this is actually a really simple thing, setting a value and then telling join adapters that your state is structured like this and that the string adapter will handle this property, and the checked property will be handled by this one. Um, that like All this stuff is predictable. It's, it's easy to generate. So we've got set reset, uh, you don't have update, um, and then same thing with checked, except checked was the boolean adapter, so it had more stuff on it. It had three things plus the default ones. So we've got set checked, that's a basic one, reset checked, uh, resets to initial state dot checked, and then here's where it gets a little weird. Uh, we started with set true, and with the property of checked, uh, I what I do is I look for the first uppercase letter, and then I insert the namespace before it. That's that's all this does, and it comes up it comes up with pretty good names pretty much all the time. So set checked true, set checked false, toggle checked. And we've got selectors, and this is easy. It just passes. It just returns the um, the property. 
But if, if these adapters, if the Boolean adapter had its own selector, it would be, it would be uh, defined here and it would, uh, yeah, it, it prepends the, the property name to it. So if, if the Boolean was, if the, if the adapter, let's say for string adapter, it was reverse, okay? There is a selector called reverse. Then here it would, it would be uh, value reverse. So, yep. So that, I already went through this. So yeah, that's how, that's how that changes. And I thought about doing it differently, but uh, th this, this has made the most sense on, on all the problems I've, I've solved with it. So yeah. There are two other things to think about with this. One is you might have state change functions that, uh, that want to change multiple properties at the same time. So there's a way to define group uh, state changes um, in, in an efficient way. So it's not spread twice. Um, so there's that. And then the other one is selectors that select for multiple pieces of state. And so there are easy ways to uh, define those, but I will not cover that in this video. That's you can um, you can look up state adapt documentation if you want to learn about those. So anyway, so with these two tools, we've got some pretty cool patterns. Um, but we need we need more. So there's this thing called adapter creators. So if we want to create an adapter that manages some properties, but we want to allow the consumer of our adapter to be able to, to use it on a state shape that includes other properties as well, what we can do is create a function that, that takes in the type parameter of, of their state. So uh, as long as it has, let's just make sure it has the option property, so value and checked. And then join adapters has this thing where you need to tell it which keys to ignore. Um, then we can return this. And then now they've got the ability to define their own, uh, their own adapter and their own extra properties and their own state shape, um, but also have the state change functions that we define for uh, these properties. So uh, if they have an interface of person, this, oh, that's weird, I never updated this. I changed all my examples to option instead of person, but eh, doesn't matter. Yeah, I even have value checked here, whatever. Okay, so here's our thing. So we've got option adapter or person adapter, whatever. And, uh, and so this has all those state change functions we saw before, just a ton of them. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna change this anyway then what they can do is they can go ahead and uh, add all those functions to their new adapter and uh, and as well as the selectors and then define their own things. I may come up with syntactic sugar for this eventually, maybe a function called merge adapters, but it's just more to learn. These are just objects, so you can spread them like this. So this is fine. So yeah, they've got this extra property here, but we don't care. We're not concerned with that, with our create option adapter function. Um, and they can also define their own state functions for it. All right, so now we get to a really interesting part, the part that I was just working on. Um, so a lot of state management libraries give you ways to handle entities. So, and you know, the entity adapter from NGRX or whatever. And these come with some basic tools like add one, add many, remove all, whatever. And so these are basically really basic functions for letting you um, manage a list of entities. But with, we have a special opportunity because we're assuming that developers are going to create an adapter for every single interface in their app. So that would include these, these entities that the entity adapter is managing. So what can we do with that? Normally the entity adapter with these different libraries is just gonna have like an update uh, function, like update many, update one. Um, and it doesn't really know what you're updating. You just pass in an update object. So like this, you pass in an array of updates and an update has an ID and a property called changes. And so this will be spread onto each entity with the corresponding ID. Okay. 
So that's a lot of work just to set the selected property to true, right? Now we know that that the developer is going to have an adapter for each option. And so they're going to have a set selected true state change function that just needs to be called. And our entity adapter, its goal is to manage the list aspect. So what if we came up with a way for the entity adapter to extend that internal state change function for the option and kind of wrap it in its own uh, function. So you could you could say, so so instead of set selected true, it could be set one selected true, or set many selected true, and then the payload would just be the, you know whatever is necessary for it to identify where the change needs to be. So uh, what we can do is exactly that. So here I've got this set many selected true, and then all it needs is the IDs because there is no payload for that specific um, action. So think of all that, all the times you've done entity adapter and you, that you've had to like create objects like this, objects like this. And now as long as you have a state adapter for the specific entity that you're storing inside Ndrex entity, uh, you can just, you can just call that state function directly, but with this, with this entity modification in it. And then, you know, we don't even, you know, I don't, I don't know why they, they should probably have just an update all function. And maybe they do. No, I didn't see it in the documentation just barely. So that, that seems like something that wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to add, but so I have it in state adapt. Um, so I've got set all selected true as another thing you could do. And so this is like really, really descriptive. It just, uh, for all entities just set selected to true. So yeah, that's pretty cool. The names do get weirder, but this is pretty good. This is, this is clear to me exactly what's happening. All right. So that's pretty cool. And it actually becomes more powerful because these state adapters, they define all kinds of selectors. And one of the common things you do when you're updating entities is determining if it should update. So if, if you're not just updating by ID, you might have you and you'd have to custom write this code that takes in the the entity. Uh, and then you'd have to uh, determine if it should update. So you, you take the entity and return some kind of you, you grab some property of it. So let's say, if you want to update all selected entities, um, you would just say if selected, update else original object. So, but these selectors um, in inside the individual option adapter, they could be used as filters so that you don't have to write that again anymore. So if you have a selected selector, um, that can be used as a filter. And, and that, that is useful in three ways. First way is uh, you have a, a default selector with NGX entity and uh, where, where you can return all entities and it's called select all and state adapt is, is just going to be called all because I do nouns with my selectors. Um, and with, if you have a filter selector for the, for the option adapter, what you can do is, uh, do, you can just return. So I have on the entity adapter, I have a selector just called selected. So it inherits the exact same name as the individual adapter, except this one will act as a filter. So it returns all the options that are selected. Okay. So I don't know exactly how useful that is for options, but it's really useful for some things. So you get to know exactly. Yeah. When you, when you want to know the count. So on maybe like a multi-select page, um, uh, where you're selecting a lot of things, you can get the count of selected items and display that somewhere. Uh, so anyway, and so I, I also calculate that I have a selector called selected count and then all are selected and it's a Boolean. So these are things we can define with, with selectors from the option adapter. And it's just like automatic. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, another way we can use, uh, filtering is to apply state changes selectively. Like the thing I was talking about. 
So uh, if you think about like the one, many, and all, those state change functions that are all over the place with NGX entity, those are kind of just selectors. You're selecting one, many, or all, and you're, you're passing in what, what it needs. But if the option adapter has a selector defined inside it already, you could actually just refer to that selector. So instead of uh, um, set many value uh, that would, and you pass in the IDs and then you would set the value for each of those IDs. I don't know when you do that because it would set them all to the same thing, but um, you, but instead of that, you could have a set selected value. So instead of many, it'd be selected. And so it'd go to all of the entities and call that selected selector on them. And then with the return value, if it's true, then it applies the update. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So I give an example here. It's not a great example, but it's, you know, something at least. So if you have this, this, uh, selector with your option adapter, that's called start with starts with a, so your option value starts with a, that that's basically it. So then the, uh, state change function that becomes available on NTD adapter would be NTD adapter dot set starts with a selected true. So all your entities or your options that start with a would be, would have the state change called on them, set selected true. So yeah, I said the names get a little weirder. I still think this is clear enough, especially when you're like used to it, but, um, I don't know what you would name a function like this anyway. You probably wouldn't. I don't know. Set, set, start, set, set selected true if starts with A. It'd be really long. This is kind of long anyway, but um, anyway, so the pattern is though the state change and then the selector, which would be all, one, or many, or the actual selector that's used to filter. So yeah. Okay. But then there's another thing, sorter selectors. So if you have a selector that returns something that can be compared with the greater or yeah, the greater sign, um, then it can be used to sort the entities. And so everything that you have, uh, like this returning entities, you can put by, and then the, the selector name. So if your selector is value, then you could have all by value. And it would return all entities and sort by the 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 value returned by the value selector, um, or or it could use your filter selector and do by sort, so selected by value. So all the options that are that are selected and it sorts them by value. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty powerful. But should one do this, you might be thinking about. Jeff Goldblum right now. I think this is really cool and I've been trying to get it to work and I think it's a good idea, but I don't really know what it's going to be like to do this in complex projects. That's why I want to get experience with real world projects before I release 1.0 because what I learned from this, if this is a viable approach, then I don't need to change anything with the core state adapt. But this is really the last thing that I can think of that the core state adapt library depends on. Like, cause if, cause if I can't create a good entity adapter with the way I have things set up with state adapt, then I'd probably need to change some things and I'll, I'll bring up another concern I had, but, uh, basically I think this is pretty good. I think it's working, but I'm, I'm open to feedback and I need to really get experience with it to really see how. Uh, like if it sucks or not, <laughs> uh, it looks pretty good to me though. There's so much code that you don't have to write now, but yeah. So let's talk about the first issue though. Remember this, remember what all this came from? It came from, uh, this and that only that. And it produced all of this. And this is awesome. Although you probably don't need half of these like ever, uh, like in, in any specific, any one project, um, they're all useful in some circumstance. And so they're all generated. Uh, but just imagine like 
if you had to do each of these for like one, many, all, and then you're combining filters and sorters and it really is like a combinatorial explosion of, of things that you can do with, with the entity adapter. So what I did is I, I made the API so that you have to specify which selectors you want to act as filters. Because honestly, you're not going to use the vast majority of, of selectors in this way. Same thing with sorters. So that limits what this actually produces um, in, the, in the final adapter. And this is actually necessary because even with this, my test, I think I might've had two properties, like two filter functions, two or, or selectors and two sorter selectors. It had something like a hundred state change functions. So it kind of explodes. Um, but you know, that's actually not too bad because I, I timed how, how much, how long it was taking. And actually compared to just a regular entity adapter, it was only taking like 50% longer. And that sounds like a lot, but it's only like one millisecond anyway. So compared to like updating the DOM, this is trivial. So, I mean, compared to the value it provides, I think it's worth it. So yeah, I think it's worth it. And then the other thing to think about is TypeScript because it actually takes work to infer types in your system. And I kind of fine tuned things like I can show you in the source code. Uh, it turns out it's a lot faster to uh, to actually specify the the output type. I'm gonna zoom in, but uh, yeah. So I did uh, right here. So I actually could have just done type inference here, but I specifically typed these, and this made the the TypeScript run three times faster. So if your TypeScript's running s slow, try doing explicit declarations of types. It actually does help. So, but I fine tune that, and and I'll I'll even show you how uh, bad or not bad it is. So let's just change this to string and see how long it takes. See, that was almost instant. Yeah, basically like three fourths of a second, something like that. Really, not anything to to be bothered at because I've worked in projects where it was like three seconds delay every time you type. It's so awful. But anyway, this isn't bad. This really isn't bad. And I don't think it'll really get worse with, with more code in, in like a reasonable project. Um, but yeah, so I'm pretty happy with this, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the other one is the names cause they are pretty awkward. Um, if you have any recommendations, let me know, but I did like a Twitter poll a while ago and this is, this is what people chose compared to my alternative, which involved underscores to make the namespacing clearer. But yeah, cause people, JavaScript developers do not like underscores. Um, and you know, these are just fine. And while you're typing, the TypeScript is going to help you. It's, it's going to recommend things and you're going to see things and you can mouse over it and you can see what types are happening. If you happen to not understand exactly what the function is actually doing. So yeah, with all this code, it actually, I think will speed up development with all the code that it saves. So yeah, in conclusion, I am sick of writing code that looks like this. I'm also sick of dot chaining and I'm sick of flipping booleans, flipping booleans and other similar boring things that I've done a trillion times. Um, but you know, I don't expect state adapters to solve this completely. It's probably going to be like a good starting point, but you know, the way I think about these things, they're kind of like UI components because there was a time when developers weren't sure everything should be a component. It maybe lasted a few months because once you started actually writing everything in components, you realized how easy it was because you didn't have to think, is this a standalone template or is this like a partial view or, you know, all these weird things that Angular just had. You can just think of um, what to name the component because everything is a component. Every chunk of UI is going to be a component. It was so simple. I think that we should write state management in the same way. All of our code should be reusable by default. We shouldn't be tightly coupling to event sources. I, I've been screwed over by that too many times. Um, that's actually why I created state at one of the two main uh, pushes that got me to create, to, to work on the prototype for state adapt, which actually took me about as long to create as this 
uh, ended the adapter. This any adapter was like a thousand lines of code for the tests and the source code. But anyway, so it's not like a silver bullet, but at the same time, neither were UI components and yet UI components are extremely valuable. So I think that state adapter, I think we should be using state adapters. If we're going to do immutable state change logic, I think this is the best way to do it. Um, unless it belongs with the component directly. Like if, if it's a very UI concern, it shouldn't be in like global state, state management type of a context. So uh, you can look at my last video if you want to learn about that. Or maybe the one before. No, it's the one where I said that I changed my mind and I think Angular needs a reactive primitive. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, state adapters are awesome. They, they're kind of like components and component libraries have sped up development by a lot. I think it'd be awesome if we had state adapter libraries, like if each component library also exported state adapters or, uh, you know, the third party existed that, that produced, you know, provided those as well. Um, I think it makes more sense for APIs though, because those kind of determine the, uh, interfaces of your state. And that's kind of kind of, that's kind of going to be more of like a state management concern than like, uh, let's say the mat option interface, but I don't know, there are possibilities that I don't know yet. And this, I feel like is kind of just scratching the surface, but you know, if all this is kind of over, uh, overwhelming or you think it's over engineering, which part of me is telling me it is, but at the same time, it might be really awesome. Uh, but it, you know, if you're concerned, then just use the regular create adapter function and just do everything manually because even that is better than the way most state management is done right now. So yeah, I strongly recommend at least taking a look at it, trying it out and please let me know how it goes. Um, yeah. If you want to get the best experience possible, try out state adapt itself, my state management library, because it was designed with state adapters at the center of it. I kind of have these like little circuit things in the background on, on the state adapt homepage. Uh, these hexagons represent componentized state management. And so uh, they are the center of what happens in state adapt. So you can start extremely simply and just incrementally add complexity as you go. Um, but it's, yeah, so the integration is super nice. I haven't used a single state management library that didn't have, uh, I haven't used a state management library that was more minimal than state adapt. So, so it's got minimalism going for it. And so I've got an RxJS library, so you can watch a video I made in the past for uh, do, using it with SolidJS and Svelte. Uh, Angular was the first library or the first framework I made it for. And React has an implementation, but it's not perfectly refined. I need I need to work on that a bit. I'm going to be working in some React code soon, so I will also work on the state adapt implementation for that as well at the same time. Anyway, so yeah, state adapt 1.0 hasn't been released yet, so this isn't production ready, but I'm really close and I would appreciate any feedback before I go ahead and release 1.0, but, and it's been too long. I, I'm going to release it really soon. So, all right. Thanks for watching. Please give me feedback and I hope you give it a try. Thanks.